We'll start off with the roll call. Present. Commissioner Abelson. Here. Vice Chair Dunlap. Here. And Commissioner Hughes. Here. And um, I'd like Commissioner Hughes to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. My pleasure. Everyone, please rise. Take the flag out of your heart. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item on the agenda will be public comment uh, that uh, for an item that is not on our agenda. I understand we have uh, three persons who have requested to uh, speak. So why don't you come to uh, the microphones on either side and state your name and address and, uh, and what you'd like to say. Felicia, you? Let's try it a third time. <laughs> Good evening, members of the commission. My name is Felicia Yu, and I live on Marengo Avenue in South Pasadena. My husband and I bought our home on Marengo over 20 years ago as newlyweds, and we can think of no better place to raise our children. The 1900 and 2000 blocks of Marengo Avenue are full of life and activity. The neighborhood embodies the best of South Pasadena. It is open, friendly, and connected. At all hours of the day, you see children, skateboarders, joggers, people walking their dogs, parents with baby strollers, cyclists going for a ride, and elderly citizens going for a stroll. Unfortunately, you also see an endless stream of cars speeding up and down Marengo Avenue. This is what is known as cut-through traffic, where commuters bypass congested main roads and resort to residential streets to get to their ultimate destination. Because Marengo Avenue is a wide street, it has borne the brunt of much of this local traffic. Drivers speed up and down Marengo to get to Huntington Drive in the north and Alhambra Road and Main Street in the south. Not only do they speed, but they fail to heed the stop signs. They run through stop signs at Marengo and Maple and at Marengo and Alhambra Road. This is a well-known danger for all the local residents. They have over time, over the years, submitted complaints to the city and asked for remediation. In just the last two years alone, I'm aware of four accidents that occurred in just that two blocks of Marengo Avenue. Three of those accidents involve sufficient speed and force to total parked cars. The most recent accident on July 27 resulted in the death of one elderly pedestrian and serious bottle injury to two more pedestrians. All three lived in our neighborhood. I would, I'm a walker myself. I would see them on my own strolls and on their tandem bicycle riding through the neighborhood. I'm here today to ask the commission to take actions to abate the speeding and traffic down Marengo Avenue. We want reasonable and achievable safety measures. I felt compelled enough to write a letter to both the city council and this commission. And within the span of several days, I had over 50 households in just that two block radius of that accident site sign on to my letter, which is attached. I do not want what happened on July 27 to ever happen again. It happened right outside my home. I will be here next month, the next month after that, and the many months that follow until there are reasonable safety measures that are implemented. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Lights. <clears throat> Good evening, members of the commission. My name is Jeff Leiter. Um, I live on Marengo Avenue. Um, the accident that my wife just spoke about occurred at the corner in front of our house. I 
I was on the scene shortly after the accident and was fortunate enough not to have witnessed the accident. When I arrived, there were three people on the ground. The two women were in shock and injured. The man was gasping for breath and bleeding from the head. All of the victims had been thrown from the crosswalk to the other side of the intersection. Mr. Wynn had been thrown the farthest. We did our best to attend to and comfort the victims while waiting for paramedics. Sadly, there was nothing we could do for Mr. Wynn. We were all afraid of doing additional harm. I hope none of you ever have to witness such an accident. And I hope we can do something to prevent this from happening again in South Pasadena. I'm not asking for drivers to do anything they are not already required to do. Follow the speed limit, which is 25 miles per hour, and stop at the stop sign. Thank you. Lighter. Next, we have Christian Ovale. Hi, uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Christian Ovalle, and I live on Marengo. I'm a neighbor of the previous speakers. Um, I live right at the uh, at the corner of Marengo and Maple. So uh, I I was taking a shower when this happened, so I didn't hear the commotion until after I'd gotten out when the accident uh, that we're talking about today happened. Uh, but it you know it shocked us. It shocked my family to visit happened right in front of our house. And um, sadly, um, I have to say, I'm not so surprised that this happened because uh, living there right at the intersection, day in and day out, I see people speeding down the street and running through the stop signs. And, uh, you know, I think we all noticed this. And in fact, even South Pasadena Police Department must know this because they since we've been living there, I've been living there for 11 years, by the way. Uh, they regularly, you know, park next to our house on Maple to catch people that are running the stop sign. So this has been, and this has been happening uh, all these 11 years. Um, the first year that we lived there, my car was one of those that almost got totaled. Um, it was parked in front of our house and was struck by a, by a, a car that ran the stop sign. So, you know, we're well aware of these issues. And I also am here to urge you to look for a solution to this. I completely agree with what Jeff said. You know, we need to do something about this to keep people to redesign the street, do something so that we don't have people just speeding down the street, running the stop signs. The way the street is right now, it's as if it was designed for faster traffic, but this is a residential neighborhood, and we don't want to. Uh, we don't want this to be a, a street that takes all this traffic that's trying to get from, I don't know, Huntington Drive to Costco or wherever they're going. Um, yeah, we. So I hope that you guys um, include us, you know, the residents of the neighborhood, and whatever plans you have for this street. Uh, include us early, not at the end. And um, that's it. I'm I'm just here to urge you to please take action as quickly as possible because, you know, every day, up and including today, you know, I see cars running that stop sign. So we need to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a commenter online as well. Okay. Joanne Knuckles, you um you can speak now. Let me unmute you. Hi, Joanne Knuckles, live on Ramona. I wasn't planning on speaking uh, tonight, but on my way home from Pasadena this afternoon, it happened to be at the wrong time and uh, going by the school behind, on El Molino behind um, Macy's. And going north, I was going south, were 25 cars or more all lined up, blocking, completely blocking the lane, driving into the school district, um, playground 
to pick up the children. And it sort of reminded me of what we have in our neighborhood. And that now with school starting, um, I think we have similar problems all over South Pasadena at all the schools. And back when Sam Zanimer was working for the city along with Margaret, they had different meetings. And at one meeting, they identified all these hot spots around town, mainly at the school and other places that were um, problems that needed to be dealt with, particularly around the schools. And now that school has started, I'm really concerned about the safety of the students safety of the pedestrians, safety of anybody that lives in the neighborhood by the vehicular traffic. So, and at the time we were going through the charrettes with um, the general plan when, when Kaiser Ramwala had his team. And I was talking to the traffic engineers, Nelson Nygaard, and they had a plan for dealing with all these hot spots in town. Well, that was, I don't know how many years ago and now they are not the consultants for the general plan. And do you all, have you ever heard or seen a list of these hotspots? And is there anything that could be done, particularly around the schools to make things safer? And I have great sympathy for the three previous speakers and the problem in their neighborhood. And it's really unfortunate with that accident. And um, so it's just a plea to see how you all may be working with the safety commission can come up with a plan all around town, wherever we have hot spots or problem areas to try and resolve those issues and make it safer for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knuckles. Uh, since these are public comments on items not on the agenda, we are not allowed to discuss these matters, but I was wondering if the um, public works director uh, had any comment on any of these uh, matters? <clears throat> um, yes, thank you, Chair Fisher, and good evening, Commissioners. Um, needless to say, these are very impactful comments tonight um, from the city staff. Uh, sincerely, um, you know, our deepest condolences to to the family and to the uh, neighbors who've had to experience this really tragic accident. There's a little consolation that I can give in words tonight um, about that. Uh, I've heard, we've heard uh, some public comments. We've written, we've received some public um, comments on this. Um, the resonating thread line through those comments has been about the speeds on Marengo. Um, though we don't have all the information uh, in front of us just yet about this accident. Uh, the police are still investigating it. Um, we are expecting a, a report that will give us information um, from a technical standpoint about the primary collision factors involved in this accident. Um, we do expect to take some sort of action once we understand uh, what that is. Um, but as we all know, uh, there's, there's several corridors through the city that experience um, speeding and traffic um, collisions and other incidents, um, namely because of the way the traffic moves through the city. Generally, um, in a north-south direction, there's a lot of issues. We've set aside funding for several streets because of this, Fremont, uh, Fair Oaks. We have projects uh, that are either ongoing or starting there. Um, we've talked about uh, Meridian in this commission, about making some resolution there. Um, and now we have, uh, you know, Marengo to discuss as well. So um, we do have our eye on this. We're expecting to get some more information. Um, and uh, certainly, as I said, the comments here resonating about looking at speeding on Marengo. So we're taking that into account, those comments. Um, so we should expect to have some more information for you uh, in the near future to discuss this uh, further. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gerber. So uh, we can't discuss this matter, but are there any questions? for the Public Works Director at this point in time. Uh, Ms. Hughes. Thank you. Um, Ted, do we know approximately when the police department and investigative um, body will have reports back? Do you have a time frame for that? I, I don't know that. Um, I can certainly update you once I have some more information. And I guess it's a general question maybe for the, uh, neighbors, does anyone know whether there was 
uh, footage from ring cameras of the accident? Does anyone know? I would assume the police department would be asking that, but in case anyone knew because you had a wing ring camera and you knew we captured the accident. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, um, do you have an answer? Yeah. Sure. And um, you can, um, come, I'm not sure how much we can discuss it, but I just want to say thank you so much for the residents who came out and kind of bear witness to their experience on the street. Um, so many times we deal with crashes and they're, they're dots on a map. And I think we really forget um, that these are human lives, these are friends and family members, and they leave behind a lot of um, devastation in their wake. And so um, I think me and as well as my commissioners, I think I am certainly committed to um, anything that I can do to improve safety um, in this community. So I know it's not easy to come here and share your story, but um, I really appreciate you sharing it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Abelson. Uh, thank you, Chair Fisher. So I echo Commissioner Dunlap's comments. Thank you for coming and thank you for your uh, comments written and otherwise. Um, I've gone to the location a couple of times already. And I'm gonna have some more comments during commissioner comments, but I just a couple of things. One, I saw that the speed feedback sign had been deployed uh, just as an FYI, it's uh, out of gas, not working anymore. So. Um, should probably have the police department pick it up and charge it. And um, second, I noticed that the the striping on the street it, it's it's better than we have on others. Um, but what I also noticed is that the stop sign is pretty faded um, uh, for Marengo traffic, and that perhaps we can look into some quicker or uh, easy to implement solutions in terms of maybe stop advance signs or pavement markings to alert people to the fact that a stop sign is coming up because right now there there isn't anything so and i know there are a number of tools available but maybe improving the signage maybe adding signage might be some shorter term things but what i would like <coughs> is to have this agenda is as chair fisher said we can't really get into the details um it'd be great to have this agendized so that we can talk about it as a commission and hear more from the residents. Um, and, and maybe it makes sense to do it after you get the accident report and maybe have some additional information. And then we can talk about possible solutions, short-term, long-term, and what studies or else might be needed to get us there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Abelson. Uh, so we we heard from uh, several residents. Uh, we understand there are some measures that have been taken thus far. We'd like to the commission would like to be would like to watch and oversee the um, evolution of things, uh, what is studied, identification of any problems, and what solutions. Uh, might be undertaken to address those problems that are identified. So for now, I'd like to ask that uh, director that you keep us informed of your of the status of your study. Um, since you don't have the police report, we'll just uh, have it as staff comments. So we will expect to get some uh, staff comments at our September meeting. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, monitor this and keep an eye on it. So we thank everyone who has uh, brought this matter to our attention and who has uh, spoken on their concerns about the location. Thank you very much. Chair Fisher. Chair Fisher. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So Councilman from Yes, I'd, I'd like to make a, a few comments. Uh, I'm not a voting member of this commission, so maybe I can speak a little more freely. Um, I just wanna say to the public uh, commenters, you've come to the right place. Um, I've been the liaison from city council with this group for almost two years. And I wanna let you know that between these folks here, they can solve a lot of problems. There's a lot of technical knowledge. There's a lot of field work that they're willing to do. Um, they work very cooperatively with staff and with our director. So um, I really appreciate you coming here because this is where the action is going to be 
you go to city council, they're going to defer to the experts who are sitting to my right. So that's number one. Number two, these meetings are agendized very strictly. And so uh, because of the Brown Act, because we want to publish ahead of time and make sure everyone has a chance to comment, we can't really go into anything. That doesn't mean this won't be addressed in a timely way. And then third, just as my own personal opinion, I've, I like the idea of looking at hotspots. I mean, we have you know, patterns of traffic that have changed because of GPS navigation. We have uh, you know, driver behavior that's changed since the uh, relaxation of the stay at home rules and, and people were not used to people on the road and now there's a lot more people on the road. What does that mean? Um, so I have every confidence this commission and uh, Director Gerber can address these issues in a timely way. Um, they have a, a, a huge agenda and if you stay, you'll, you'll hear how much Public Works is carrying right now. Uh, we have increased their bandwidth we have increased their resources. Hopefully they can do more. But again, the need is always just so huge. But thank you, because I think you're shedding some light on a really important issue. We also have six email comments um, that will be made part of the uh, record for this meeting. And my apologies, Council Liaison, um, John Premeth, Mayor Pro Temp, John Premeth is present as well. Okay. Okay, we'll go to um, agenda item number two, a project status update. And um, you can see from those of you who have an agenda, how many different items the public works director is handling and he gives us a status report on them. So uh, will you give us an update on, uh, on the projects? Of course, and, and I'll add this is, um, only in the transportation realm of, of this list of projects, uh, uh, which is just one part of our public works department. Um, so as we've been um, continually providing uh, is a update on project status across both our operations projects and our capital improvement projects. Um, notably, we've made some um, significant uh, progress on some. Um, we have recommenced our um, street design work for resurfacing projects. And um, we've spent two days now um, in the field with um, our consultant, uh, walking every step of all the streets that we're planning to resurface to make sure that we're incorporating um, the appropriate um, asphalt replacement option, um, curb and gutter replacements, um, ADA uh, crosswalks, sidewalks, uh, driveway apron replacements where appropriate. Um, so we're tagging these items. Uh, in general, we're finding that um, some of the areas that were previously designated as um, something as a minor rehabilitation, like a, a slurry seal or something like that, really have had significant um, base deflection in the street and so need to be reconstructed. Found a lot of um, locations that have uh, significant drainage issues because they don't have a gutter and in some cases they don't have a curb. Um, and so uh, either from irrigation or from stormwater or runoff, uh, there's a lot of cavities and infiltration into the asphalt, which was uh, promoted its deterioration. Um, so we have a lot of things to fix, but um, we're identifying them from the structural point of view. Um, now, from the uh, transportation point of view, um, we are taking into consideration the direction from the council and the commission to incorporate uh, more pedestrian friendly locations, uh, bicycle facilities. Uh, so, for example, our biggest undertaking under this set of design work has been um, the Pasadena Mission and Arroyo intersections. And so we've gone through several um, design iterations there. And uh, we'll share those with you at a, at a future meeting, how we've um, come to our conclusion and the different options we're considering. Um, but largely we've been able to reconfigure those to um, have bicycle lanes, um, uh, class one or class two bicycle lanes, um, I'm sorry, class three or class two bicycle lanes um, on all those streets on mission, um, carrying through Arroyo onto Stony down towards the park there. You know, the limit of that project is at that intersection. So we're not carrying the lane down, but we actually get 
we can get bicyclists through the intersections over to Stony, um, along Arroyo, and also along uh, Pasadena. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we've also made some improvements to make um, all sides of those intersections walkable, um, because we know the people, you know, they can be coming down Arroyo, they can be coming up Pasadena, um, and uh, there's a bus stop there, there's a school there. Um, so yeah, so we're very excited about that. We'll be excited to share that with you. So there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, we are finding there's significant impact from roots in many streets from very mature trees. So we have to do some more work um, in understanding how we can preserve those trees and also correct the condition. That's a very difficult task, uh, but we spent some time on that and we're excited um, to move that forward. Um, other notable um, work that's been done, uh, we've completed the design and the specifications for the RFBs, uh, the three that we were intending for two for mission and one at um, Fremont and Linden. And so um, we expect to have a design package out for solicitation, hopefully in the, in the coming month uh, so that we can uh, start construction on that. Um, and that'll be in this, definitely in this fiscal year, hopefully we can start before the end of the year. So I left my packet on my desk. So I have, I'm doing this by my phone here. Um, we, uh, we took a look at the, um, we're still working on the uh, Ramona, Oak and Fremont, Rollin and Bank um, traffic situation. Um, we're working with a consultant um, on uh, directives and options for Holy Family um, based on their specific plan approval from the 90s. So that's a little bit of a research effort, but we think we'll have some progress to report on that for you next time. As far as the high school, um, we did go out and meet uh, with the high school representatives, the principal and the vice principal about possibly adding the loading zone in front of Fremont, um, which uh, was a good intention. We thought that we'd have enough space in front of that area there, and it actually would be um, a decent loading area. The complication came up when we were actually walking through with the high school representatives of their um, current drop-off configuration that begins on Linden and exits out on Fremont, where we think there's going to be significant interference in that. Um, so we still have a little bit more work to do. Uh, we're going to, uh, this was before school started that we did this evaluation. Um, so we're going to spend some time um, in the coming week looking at that while school is actually in session. Um, I have probably a few others I could touch on, but uh, I guess I'll open up to any specific questions about the projects we have on this list. Uh, Commissioner Hughes, do you have any uh, questions for the Thank public you, works Chair. director? Just a few. <laughs> on the Fair Oaks traffic signals, last meeting we talked about the fact that the software training had taken place. Do we know when we're going to have dis when it'll be dispatched and ready to go? And I know we were going to coordinate for the buses, but is there are we, do we have a time frame when we think we can, this will be activated? Um, we're close to wrapping it up. We have a couple, um, we've got the software installed, but we don't have it configured. And we haven't really had a lot of time this last month to get staff up to speed on how to do that. Um, we've just done, we've just sort of um, done our first session of training. The, um, the, this ITS system and the, Traffic Management Center is a completely new concept for our staff. Um, just how to operate it and um, what our responsibilities are is a significant um, item. We are also running up against an issue with our traffic signal maintenance contract so that when we take over the project and we're actually responsible for the equipment, um, we don't have, right now we're sort of, um, in limbo and trying to have a traffic uh, signal maintenance system, which would uh, also be responsible for the software and the cabinets and the controllers. So we're trying to resolve that issue before we fully take this project over and, and we can complete it. So we, uh, I'm thinking on the order of probably about uh, four to six weeks, we think, to be complete. what our guidelines are for activation and coordination. So if we, is there a, a criteria, like if traffic is not moving or that it's you know, a speed situation or backed up, do we then activate more per access through with, with more green? What is the guidelines? Because one of the th thoughts is, is if we 
can make people feel more assured about profit flow on their ups, we might get them off Marengo to know that there's that they're not you know side cutting into the residential. They're not gaining anything because there's there's the uh, wider and and more uh, commercial developed uh, thoroughfare through Fair Oaks. So um, typically our option is to extend green timing. Um, we're limited in, in some of the other aspects of what we're able to do with the timing programs. Um, we're, um, that's apart from establishing like exclusive phases for pedestrian crossing. Um, this project, the intention behind it was to install the hardware and the equipment and the software in order to make those types of changes. The next iteration of the project, which is a, um, something we're undertaking with KOA, would be advising us on um, actual um, physical changes we can make to Fair Oaks, as well as updates to the controller uh, infrastructure. So, um, so we have a, a general understanding of what our uh, what our capabilities are, and uh, as far as capabilities, I'm talking about our um, like legal and regulatory capabilities. The equipment itself is incredibly robust; it can basically do anything we'd like it to do. Um, so we do need some advisement on what we should do on Fair Oaks in terms of making those changes. And that's where um, our next project is just, just getting started now with KOA will sort of overlap into this hardware installation project. And then I just had also had a question on the street improvements. Um, when we, you said you're working on the final list of what you, what you're thinking we're going to, you know, from the ones going back to 18, 19, 2021, et cetera, that will, you're re-looking at that and reprioritize, correct? Not yet. What we're doing right now is actually finishing the design. Um, so we have a, we have the streets I'm talking about, um, we have a, a design in place. And so our hope is to get to a 90% design with the comments that we've had from the field these last couple of weeks um, so that we can show you the work, uh, finalize it. Um, and then uh, bid that work out so that we can get construction going in 2023. As a parallel effort, we need to take a look at the reprioritization of the streets. So all of the streets that I are on this list, with the exception of maybe one little section, are all bright red on our pavement condition index map. Um, so they all need work, um, but they're you know red in a sea of other red streets that need uh, work as well as long as as well as like you know, orange and yellow streets that are in the decline and need quick attention so that they don't uh, further decline. Uh, so that work um, is still ahead of us. And it's a multi-step approach because um, we have to do a little bit of uh, forensic accounting work to understand, um, you know, how much money the state has given us, how much can we hold on to, what has to be given back, hopefully none. Um, so there's a, there's a larger effort behind that prioritization list. We're also tying in the wa necessary water improvements, the necessary sewer improvements, and then any other utility improvements from our you know, other com um, communications or um, energy utility providers in the area to make sure that their projects are incorporated into the work that we're doing too. There's nothing worse than those streets getting cut up again after we've done them. So yeah, the prioritization effort, um, we're getting underway that you're talking about, but this is actually just taking, um, picking back up um, where street work was left off so we can actually get some um, construction done in 2023. I think the two things to think about with that is how much we would allocate just for the slurry seals, because it, you know the, the prong process of the streets, we know that we need the refurbishment to a greater extent, obviously with all the, uh, adjuncts such as the, the the sewer lines, the water lines, power potentially if there's any Edison equipment and ADA considerations. Then there's you know we've always had money that we've used just for slurry fixes, but then somewhere in there too to make sure that you have as part of that process letting the community know enough in advance that we're going to be ripping up these streets and when we're going you know we start thinking about that we know that get them involved. Yeah, there's really, you know, we have these types of questions every day is when is my street in the schedule? Um, the schedule we have uh, only goes out a few years and it's based solely on a uh, pavement condition. It's not based on any of the other factors I just mentioned. So really what we're trying to do is balance between streets that the council has approved, streets that the state has approved um, for funding, um, 
where the payment condition need is, uh, what that level of um, rehabilitation is. Like you mentioned, slurry seal down to like reconstructing the street completely, where our utility priorities are. So there's a lot of factors that um, we're trying to consider. And, and so we have this multi-pronged approach of basically just trying to get work done that's already in the pipeline. There's no sense in halting design work, even if it's not a priority, even if we wouldn't consider that a priority street today, when we've already invested the money and the streets about is almost ready to be rehabilitated, we want to move those projects forward and get that work done. Um, because the other um, factor is that we need to spend that money before we lose it also. So that is one part of it. And then the other part of it is, as you mentioned, uh, taking all these factors in consideration, it may be that that um, five-year plan is altered in the final years, but our, our ultimate goal is to have a long-term plan so that we can advertise where streets are um, and when uh, your street will be you know, paved so that we have an answer for those citizens that are asking those types of questions. Right, because to that point, I just want to bring bring to the attention, which I know you know, is that when we look back, when you go back X amount of years, what was approved, funding was set aside back to 2018, 19, you know, 1920. And so people saw that and know that that was approved, money was set aside. And then we have to kind of now tell them that it's been X amount of years, we haven't done it. And we're revisiting this, but we might need to recalculate based on the changing conditions, the funding, what's approved, et cetera. But we just need to be mindful that people out there five years, four years ago thought, hey, my street's on the list. It's going to be. So I just think it's we need to remember that. So that's why I think it's important. The more we can get out with here's where we're accessing, but here's our, our list and here's where we had things and here's where they are now in, in priority, because people thought that was kind of a done deal. And I just I don't want people to be totally surprised and to understand the process and to understand that we are being diligent to really do this right now. And for a number of reasons, things didn't get done. Yeah, it, it, it could be a bit frustrating, especially from the staff perspective, because um, some of those streets that were included may have just been, may have been included as um, a, re, a simple resurfacing. And you know, if we did that, we're basically throwing good many after bad by not actually fixing an underlying problem with that street. Um, and so our direction, what we understand our direction to do, to be, is to really put the city on a long-term trajectory for healthy, maintainable, sustainable streets. And in order to do that, we have to correct some of these problems so that um, we do have adequate you know, concrete structure and mitigated tree root issues so that later on in 10 years, the city can come back and resurface that street under a sustainable uh, pavement program instead of us just sort of throwing more money deeper into that street that um, wasn't adequately repaired uh, now. So yeah, that's completely understood. Um, so we're hoping to be able to provide uh, this commission and council some really uh, intricate guidance on how we're putting that together and sort of walk everybody through um, our strategy and, and um, you know, how we see this working moving forward. And do you think you'll have that put together with the consultant when? We're targeting the beginning of the year to do some sort of session with council to discuss that. Um, that's what our hope is. And in that vein, would we be looking at, which, which are you working like, are we talking just the, the streets that have all been, are we talking again, going back and looking at the totality of all the streets in the city? Because the pavement study was a couple years old. And I mean, are we looking at what we had had from 18, 19, 19, 20, those? Or are we looking at everything? Are we reviewing the, the condition index? What, what do you, how is this coming together for the beginning of the year? Um, we don't know how far out that it will be. We're hoping that it at least addresses like a five, 10 year plan at, at, a, at a start because we're also trying to coordinate this with our other utility improvements. Um, and we have, um, we have 30 year plans on those other items, um, but um, it, it really depends on how much we're able to sort of predict the decay of the other streets because, um, 
I don't have an answer for you just yet. We're hoping to have it much more comprehensive, but we, since we're just getting to the scope and I, we're just really understanding the work ahead of us, um, we just don't know how much work we're gonna be able to do in the months ahead um, and how much a benefit that will be to sort of come up with decades of planning that we don't even know if we can afford. It might just make more sense to look at a short-term view of what we can do based with the money we have and then um, project out the type of investment the city has to make to take it farther. So we're sort of balancing between those two things. And the last point, last question, to kind of put the, the idea is to, as we look at streets, the one thing to also consider somewhere and maybe put as, as an option like is full streets because it's moving in that direction um, so that we consider that for the resurfacing and because there's going to be more federal money coming for that, I believe, out of the newest uh, bill. Yeah, we've heard about that. There's there. another so, city that was able to take a, a advantage of a federal grant for um, that type of coding that goes on the streets. Um, so there's a there's a a number of different technologies we've heard about that we might want to pilot out on some streets to see what the impacts are. Um, and so we've taken that in consideration. We've also looked at um, almost like a, a midpoint between um, resurfacing and slurring in terms of like using the, like this asphalt rubberized um, solution. Um, but what we're really trying to do is find a good test case for that in the city because a lot of the streets uh, are sort of beyond that point. Um, so we're trying to juggle um, the really heavy, serious, um, rehab work versus the streets that were recently done, not forgetting that those also need to be put on a maintenance cycle as well so that we don't you know, lose those ones. So yeah, that's a very good point about the cool streets. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Dunlop. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ted, thanks for bringing up the, um, the Mission Street at Arroyo intersection. Um, I think that it's exciting that something um, is happening there. I know particularly traveling in the eastbound direction, um, not at Arroyo, but once you get to where Mission changes the Pasadena Ave, it can be really tricky when you're heading east and trying to judge you know, traffic to the right and traffic oncoming, and you're not always used to yielding, <laughs> um, or you're used to, yeah, people usually yielding when you're going straight and they're turning left. So um, I'm excited to see whatever um, recommendations come out of that. Yeah, um, we spent a good, at least two hours there with a whole mm -hmm. bunch of staff from every angle looking at what was going on in the morning. Um, we witnessed some real interesting interactions between drivers out there. Uh, so that really informed you know um, what we plan to do. So we're excited about totally. showing that to you. And the other thing, I saw that there's being outreach conducted by the city of Pasadena um, for, I think it's phase one of the stub and in the streets, Pasadena Avenue, Columbia Street. And I noticed that on Columbia, the, the striping that's the, the city of Pasadena is soliciting feedback on conflicts with our uh, measure and project recommendations. So um, um, what would be the process for reconciling? Those? Sure, it shouldn't conflict. In fact, we've been collaborating on that and talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, what started out as um, a striping project has sort of grown into, um, you know, a pretty substantial project on their end. Uh, and they're, they're seeking their Measure R money to do that, where we're in parallel seeking the Measure M money to work on that project. So we're uh, in step with that work. Um, they, we talked about it and they wanted to do the community outreach component of it first and take that information back to cycle it back into our discussion. Um, so we're sort of waiting on what that stakeholder engagement yields on their end to, to start talking about design um, ideas again. Okay. But we, we basically came to an agreement on the conceptual layout of the Pasadena Fremont Columbia intersection. And so their work is sort of, um, going from there, I guess I'd say. Okay. Do you have a, do you know the timeline for that stakeholder engagement? Um, for their stakeholder engagement, um, I know it's ongoing right now. And then we were supposed to, to sort of review it in a few months. I'm not exactly sure how it works, uh, for them. Okay. 
Um, but I know we, we, we meet, we meet monthly and we talk about that project and yeah, the update's been that we met, um, this month prior to their, um, I think they had a meeting last week, mm -hmm. like a, like an, uh, an open park type of meeting. Uh, so we met prior to that. And so we're going to, we're looking forward to meeting in a couple of weeks to hear about what they found out there. Okay. And so the Arroyo Verdugo, um, measure M list or measure M projects, would that be, would the scope be flexible for it, for that extent? You would yeah. have to go back to Metro if you change the I'm not sure. I, I kind of warned them about that because we had to do some more. Um, so, you know, we had done all of our work here as a commission and we went to council and we've continually had work to do on that, that as we sort of, um, guide that through the Metro process. So, um, if you recall, we had very, you know, a very, um, small amount of funding dedicated to that project with the understanding that we would focus on striping and that um, Pasadena would be able to uh, cost share majority of it. Um, with the additional work that Pasadena is um, recommending, which is all good stuff um, along Columbia for improvements, the price has gone significantly up. So that's kind of the challenge we're understanding now is that, um, you know, how do we, uh, how do we keep that funding committed when the project costs might increase? So I've sort of posed that to uh, Metro's consultant and we, we're, we haven't you know, finished that conversation yet. So I basically filled out all the paperwork um, to the extent that we had discussed about the yeah. project and sort of referencing what Pasadena would be doing. So there may be a funding gap for us, but maybe not because Pasadena might take a lot of the costs on, for example, um, the work on the west side of Orange Grove on Columbia, um, where we were going to do some minor, um, we were going to do some, uh, we have planned some minor, you know, striping improvements on the northwest corner. And then we had discussed running edge lines all the way down to Hillside. Um, Pasadena is going to cover that cost and do the whole work because of where the border line is. So we may have a less substantial cost share on the other section of Columbia. Um, we just don't understand it yet, but it's a good point and we're yeah. trying to work that out. No, appreciate it. I saw the outreach and, and wanted to make sure that, that those are coordinated, but it sounds like in your monthly meetings, you're well on it and, and, and coordinating with the city of Pasadena. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Abelson. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Um, I'll try to run through mine quickly. My first ask though is if, if uh, Commissioner Dunlap and or uh, Director Gerber can share with the commission. I'm fascinated to know what this proposal is by the city of Pasadena, for the area that just described, uh, Pasadena Avenue, Columbia. I haven't seen it. I haven't heard anything about it. And considering anything they do there most certainly will impact. I, you, you may be aware, but, but I would certainly like to at least see what it is they're proposing. Because we, I haven't received it. And I received a text message from oh. someone who went to the outreach. Oh, no, so. I'm, I'm glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to review it completely yet. Um, but uh, from our initial discussions, we were talking about um, changing the, you know, starting from the intersection at Fremont and Columbia, Pasadena, about um, creating a, um, a two-way turn lane, uh, just as we described in our Measure M project. Um, all along Columbia with striping. Um, part of the work that Pasadena is discussing is um, a, uh, you know, replacing the signal there and making changes to the signal to sort of recenter it across the intersection to um, align with the striping changes we're making. And that's where a lot of the costs are coming from because that's a very expensive ende endeavor to uh, reinstall a signal. Right. So I, that's the extent of what I understand. I haven't gotten to look at what they showed to the public the other day, um, but that's what I'm hoping to get more information on when we talk. Well, about I guess, it. yeah, I, yeah, it would be great if maybe you could reach out to them and just say, hey, can you share with us what it is that you shared with your citizens? And it would be great if you could then push that to us, because I would like to see it. Sure. Um, they may have given us an early version of it. Um, but I know that there was significant comment that they received the other day. So I'm looking forward to hearing like the, all that put together about right. what the proposal was and what the feedback was together. Right. Um, okay. So a couple quick things. So street improvements, not to beat the proverbial dead horse, but, um, 
you refer to the fiscal year 2019 2020 street improvements as the ones you're uh, working on. I thought what you were working on was not only 2019 2020, but also the 2018 2019, the ones that had completed design. Not, and I just want to make sure. You were correct. Okay. So the idea here is that the 2018 2019 projects that had completed design, and we're trying to complete the design for the 1920 projects, so we can put out one bid solicitation for one large construction project for both of those years. Okay, so just for example, um, I want to like uh, one, one of the streets that had design completed that was 2018 2019 is Sterling Place, for example, I just want to make sure that's one of the ones that's part of what you're working on and meeting about. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, Sterling Place from Grand to the okay. end of the street is I just want to make sure we're talking part about the, the same thing. Yes, yes, Perfect. the design is completed. Okay. That. Um, and then a very small portion of all these projects is the replacement of street name signs. And, and we haven't had a significant street project in a while. So I just wanted to make sure you had that on your radar that part of these projects includes updating the street name signs from the old version to the new that's for, typically been for those streets for those streets that are part of the projects you're actually doing yes and, and that's sort of us um taking a look at um all the improvements that we can do through one pass of that street whether it be a utility curb and gutter in some cases we're touching driveways driver aprons in some cases we're touching sidewalks not in all cases it depends on you know, the condition of the sidewalk and how far separated it is from the street and maybe better as a separate project rather than putting. Oh, no, I understood. I just want to make sure yeah, very the, small the street signs. Yes. not forgotten. Yes. It's, okay. Um, no, I know you're doing your best. Um, Columbia Avenue striping and signal improvements. Um, do you have a sense? Because I was going to ask you if you're still meeting monthly. You are, which is fantastic with the city of Pasadena. Yes. Have they updated you at all about the striping work for that um, Columbia Orange Grove to Hillside piece, you know, with the edge striping and then the corner. Yes. I know the design was done a couple of months ago, except for the additional edge line. Sure. Um, so the design was done. We added the edge line. They redid the design. Um, we approved it uh, just in this last couple of weeks. So uh, it's already in the queue for their, um, I think their actual work is done. And unlike us, I think their work is done by another department than the people who design it. Uh, so we're just waiting to see how that's gonna be scheduled. So uh, we're basically, as soon as they're ready to go, we'll both coordinate um, you know, parking notifications for the street, and then we'll uh, put in the striping and the edge lines. So, Fantastic. Um, so it's basically, is, is it's ready to go. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the on-call contracts. I know last month council approved, you're moving forward with those, right? Yes. So um, what's what's left to do to actually make that happen and get those folks on board and sure start working uh, on the list. A couple of things. So, um, so yeah, they were approved on July twenty seventh. Um, during the council meeting, there were some slight changes to the language in the master on call services agreement. So we're getting those approved. The changes approved um, by the other side, by the vendors. Well, by the our 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 city attorney and then the vendors. Got it. Um, we gave all the vendors during the um, during the solicitation process. We gave all the vendors what we thought the language would be at the end, which was like ninety five percent of the language. Um, so we had uh, most of the vendors accepted the terms and conditions of our standard language wholly and completely. Others had certain issues or exceptions to the language. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to execute the contracts first for the ones that didn't have terms and conditions issues, and then see if we can um, resolve the terms and condition issues for the other set. In some cases, we might not be able to resolve it, but in, some, in other cases, if their scope is something um, that's not really, you know, requires um, a whole lot of, uh, you know, indemnification, like, uh, then we might be able to move forward. Um, Otherwise, if we can't come to terms, then we wouldn't necessarily contract with those. But um, we did ask for quite a bit of um, approvals for the, from the council. We had a whole list of vendors um, so that we would have multiple options, especially in the transportation and traffic area. I think we had 
um, 17 vendors that we hold on board. Um, and um, some of those had exceptions. And then some of them also modified the breadth of their scope. Like we had a whole list of things that we wanted them to do. Some of them said, well, we'll do these ones, but not these ones. Some said, we'll do these and this. Some of them said, we'll do the whole package. So, um, so right now we're basically assigning vendors to these projects. Um, if we're able to execute the contracts with them, which will be in the next couple of weeks, um, then we'll just move forward with the task order and start the work. Um, our first meeting with one of those is tomorrow. Um, and then, so, that, so that's the remaining work to answer your question. It's just finalizing the contracts. Um, we'll get the immediate ones done first. We have a list of projects that we wanna focus on first, a number of transportation projects. Um, so once we have those first set approved, then we will you know, take that subset and focus on those ones and then um, approve the other ones. I hope I answered your question. I kind of went around a little and, bit. Oh, and then some. Okay. And then right. one last easy one. Easy. Um, Mission Arroyo, which you've already yes. discussed. Yes. I just want to make sure part of what you're contemplating is whether it's a concrete meeting or something, some device to protect the signs that are currently in the unprotected meeting that are re routinely knocked down. I just want to make sure that was part of it because that was part of Absolutely. We, we, we've about. added several raised medians in that area. Okay. One primarily where I, I know you're talking about, which is that um, we've We've our conceptual idea is basically straighten that out, um, you know, from mission from mission through to Stony, um, slow it down, uh, narrow it, and we've added like concrete raised uh, medians for refuge and for sign protection. Um, we can also we might add some at the leading edge of those back towards mission. We might even add some you know plant material or something like that. Um, in a way that doesn't uh, obstruct any sort of, you know, visibility for drivers or pedestrians. Um, and then we've also added um, a concrete median um, as mission sort of turns into Pasadena to sort of slow that down. And, and, and um, you know, people, people take that turn pretty quickly. And so we want to uh, be able to um, separate out that traffic a little bit um, have, have like a split median. Oh, the uh, traffic on is going onto Pasadena versus the traffic continuing towards Stony. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So yeah. we we actually uh, we added two concrete medians. Um, one, I, there may actually be three there. Where there's one, um, as you're, you know, be easier when I bring the drawing here. But, oh yeah, and I didn't want to. But, I didn't mean to. But yeah, but I know what you're talking about where that stop sign is now that gets knocked down. Yeah. There's a triangular median there. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great, all, all good questions. Um, it, it was good news that you've been able to get your on-call contracts uh, approved by the council, um, but you also had staffing needs as well. Did you wanna comment on any uh, additional staff or uh, upgrading of staff? Yes, um, so you know, in our audience tonight, we have our new uh, Deputy Public Works Director, Antenna Tassaye, <laughs> attending. Um, we have Katrina Piquero. She's our new um, operations manager for Public Works. Uh, we have extended an offer that's been accepted for a, another engineer, a civil engineer assistant, to start in September. Um, I had mentioned that we had already hired a senior civil engineer. Um, some of you may have met, and she's been in the city for a couple of weeks. We're in the we're starting interviews for our management analysts. We have two of those, and that's really going to help us get a lot of our work off the ground because um, there's a lot of administrative burden, as you can imagine, to getting things to council, getting contracts approved, managing the budget, managing grants. So that will sort of take a lot of um, the work off the backs of our technical <laughs> staff. We should be focusing on projects and project management. Um, and then we're backfilling the ranks on a lot of our um, operational staff. We have a maintenance worker interview happening. Um, and uh, we, We'll be bringing, we expect to bring the transportation manager position to council, hopefully September 7th, um, as well as backfilling our, you know, um, supervisor staff for parks and facilities. That's great news. Um, Director Gerber, I wanted to, I wanted to comment on the um, Ramona Oak Rollin Fremont High School plan. Um, there is a different recommendation than the one 
that our subcommittee recommended um, last year. Um, Commissioner uh, Abelson, who was chair of the uh, commission at the time, appointed appointed a subcommittee of him and myself, and, and we met out in the field with Tatovic of your staff to look at the circulation and such. I guess at that time the uh, South Pasadena High School did at least we didn't see it have uh, their formal in on Linden, out on Fremont and Bank operation. And that probably was due to the fact that we had the COVID pandemic and not all students were at school and some had a late start and maybe that was part of it. So we had recommended that uh, in front of the high school, um, south of Bank Street and possibly north of Bank Street that we create loading zones so that uh, students and their parents have a place to drop off. So I think uh, since there's another recommendation of loading them through the parking lot, I think we'd all like to go observe it to see if that would be more effective than the recommendation to have loading on Fremont Avenue. So I'd, I'd like to suggest if uh, you're willing and Commissioner uh, Abelson is willing to revisit that location and observe the operation with the high school loading. Um, and I would suggest that we uh, do it on Monday morning, um, August 22nd. So uh, I take it you're in agreement with that? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, so um, when we had met with the high school, um, you know, we were trying to move fast to possibly implement that loading zone before high school started. So when we met, um, there wasn't really much happening in that parking lot. We were able to walk freely around and um, we actually observed some other uh, issues with how their exit works that we could share with you when we go on site. Um, but yeah, we weren't able to observe any sort of actual um, circulation during that. So it would be great actually to have you join us and we'll take a look at that next week. Okay. So We'll meet at uh, 8 a.m. on uh, Monday the 22nd um, in front of the high school there on Fremont. Yes, Commissioner Hughes. Um, on that regard, one thing to keep in mind is that the schools now have a later a mandated start date, start hour um, for the high schools. I don't think they start before 8.30 now because of this change in the law. You know, I think Holy Family is earlier because they don't, they're not, they're, not just high school. So we timing wise, again, that's that's going to change things from what it might have been. Sure. Uh, we talked to high school about that and they've implemented that. So now so uh, the condition we observe next week will be with that implemented. And it's my understanding that school begins at 830. Is that? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, that's correct. So we'll, we'll catch that period. But Holy Family might start earlier which might be impacting the traffic too. So you might, there might be two different start times. Right. Well, there always has been, but I guess we're just looking at the uh, South Pasadena High School and Holy Family is a work in progress. And we, we've observed that it, uh, a few times now <laughs> yes. in depth. So we're aware yes. of the Holy Family. And one quick question, Chair, if I may ask Ted, when you guys are looking at um, Mission Arroyo, Doni, one of the things maybe also, I don't know if you've looked at the lighting for at nighttime, because it tends to be very dark. We don't necessarily see it as much in the summertime, obviously, but in the um, in the winter months, with the lighting there, it, that's a very dark descent. When you're coming off mission and you're going down into the Arroyo, that's very dark. Now, especially if, you know, when you've got the batting cages and that's still open, you've got residual light that's there. But it is pretty dark. And if we're going to do improvements, it'd be interesting to see if there's any lighting that we could consider for improving that. Sure. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, we can, we, of course, we're looking at all this during the day. So we'll, you know, observe that at night and see if there's anything we could do about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. We'll go to um, our first action item, I, item number three, the slow streets program, where we have a recommendation regarding a professional services contract with Alta Planning and Design. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Fisher. Um, 
So just a little bit of background. We've been talking about this for a while, and, and so we're finally here. Um, we had worked, if you recall, we had worked on this at the end of 2021. Um, there was a large amount of grant money that was available that we didn't want to lose. So, um, and there wasn't a lot of time to complete the design work that we intended to do. Um, and this is all to um, install what we know as like slow streets as, uh, as temporary equipment, um, restriping uh, fixtures to uh, provide usable space in the street. Um, for pedestrians, for cycles, and uh, slow down um, the street and create like an open street environment. And so um, at the end of 2021, we had almost finalized uh, designs for several residential streets, and we had gotten um, work underway for um, Mission Street as a, as a more of a commercial um, installation. Um, there was a lot of work done by um, the consultants in terms of like an initial design and a traffic study by ITERIS. Um, but at the end of the project, we had pivoted to spending money to buy equipment so that we could install, um, install it later. Uh, and so uh, a couple months ago, we had come to the commission to talk about restarting this project and what it would look like. We wanted to transform the project from COVID relief to a demonstration of what mission could look like, um, extend the timeline, try to base the timeline around the holidays if feasible um, as sort of a, a move towards economic development. And this had commission um, had agreed with that I, in concept to extend the time and sort of redirect the project to a, to a test um, case for a permit installation. So since then, we've done a couple things. Um, we um, uh, we've received almost all of the equipment. We still don't have the parklets and the furniture in hand. I found out this morning it's in New York City, so it's on its way here. Um, but uh, certainly, we will be receiving it soon. Um, and uh, you know, we will have it, but um, obviously, it has to be designed and, and set up. Um, we also started interfacing with the city manager's office and community development on this project. Um, given sort of the rescoping of this into a long-term effort, a, a, you know, a short-term test for a possibly long-term effort, um, we, you know, uh, there's a significant uh, economic development component to this uh, for the businesses and for the city as a whole, and so we have sort of partnered. Um, in this project to see, you know, how that will work. Um, and so in that, we joined the um, economic development group in the city manager's office quarterly um, business meeting. They have a, like a, a South Pasadena business meeting. And we had a few attendees from Mission Street, um, one from Fair Oaks. I think there was some other conflicts. There wasn't a huge turnout, but we sort of talked to them about the program, talked about our potential holiday plans, um, and sort of, we got, we got a lot of questions about how this would work, a lot of concerns about uh, an adequate enough outreach and adequate enough information about design and configuration and things like that. Um, so in general, we've got a lot of comments about having a really um, robust public outreach. So um, we took that information, we went back to our design team um, and we figured out a few things. So, um, uh, I guess the high level items are that um, we need a lot of time to to cycle the mission project through um, public outreach. And so you'll see in the um, contract tonight, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, pretty significant amount of um, outreach work there and some um, some um, provisions so that we can have uh, the design sort of informed by that. So let me step aside from that conversation on one for one second here and just basically you know talk about what we're trying to do here tonight um so we have a we have a contract a proposed contract with alta planning and there's several sub consultants um we have a budget uh we have a schedule uh we'd like to take this to council um september set hopefully september 7th in the coming weeks for approval so we can get started what we're coming to you tonight is to talk to you about how we think this program is going to work um about about the schedule 
and seek your advisement on the contract and also your recommendation to bring it to city council. Um, so to return to what I was saying, we had considered in our previous meeting about possibly trying to get this started at the end of the year, getting a lot of it installed for the holiday season. We see a lot of barriers with that, um, namely uh, the equipment not being here just yet, um, our lack of ability to get started. You know, it's almost September. We haven't been able to get started. Um, and then also being able to do sufficient public outreach. So our current proposal is that we, you know, do all the work that we had talked about doing, getting the residential system installed uh, as soon as possible in the, in the next couple months, um, and then having the uh, Mission Street installation done in the spring and carry it to the end of the year. And then if it's successful, bring it through um, the holidays and then you know, possibly leave some components in place, like namely the parklets, and then possibly remove some other components, um, the road diet in particular, uh, um, because it wasn't intended to be a, a permanent installation. Um, and, and that's basically the schedule that we're looking at now. So this really allows us to do a really significant amount of public outreach, um, a really refined design, and most importantly, it allows us to get it installed uh, correctly. Because one of the challenges we had in sort of negotiation, negotiating how this would work with um, the Alta team was um, how to have them complete the design and the installation. So what we, what we decided to do was have um, Alta's consultant active SGV do the residential installation, but actually have um, Alta help us with the um, uh, contract documents so that we can actually hire um, another company to actually install this quickly uh, and fast and safely um, for you know, us to you know, experience it right away and then have it installed for a long period of time. So you, the contract before you basically does um, the you know, initial kickoff, the design work, the outreach, the engagement with this commission, with council, um, all of the advertising components, including a website, um, flyers, handouts, um, returning back to some of the modeling that we have to do, and I can talk about that in one moment, um, the residential installation, and then also project evaluation throughout the entire uh, effort, because that's the most important part when it comes to um, the policy decision of what do we do for the future of uh, Mission Street. We really want to get a lot of feedback out of this project to see how it worked, both from a technical perspective and then also just, you know, people's use and enjoyment of the space um, so that we can have, you know, a final project report that would envision, you know, a newer configuration of Mission Street. Um, and then from the economic development perspective, we have some optional tasks to assist the businesses in their parklet design, assist them with their furniture selection, um, guidelines for that, um, you know, other, other type of placemaking work along the, along the street. One comment that came out of the economic uh, development quarterly meeting was um, from the Fair Oaks business, you know, what about Fair Oaks? How would they benefit from this project? Um, our response was that, that we really can't make any roadway configuration changes to Fair Oaks. But we can certainly do something on the sidewalk like we're doing on mission with some, you know, exciting furniture or, or some sort of, um, you know, I guess I'll use the word again, like placemaking feature that would, would attract people to that um, business, to that area. So, um, so that's what you have before you tonight is our recommendation to move forward with this contract um, so that we can bring this to council. We would uh, get started right away so we can undergo the residential installation. Um, and then start our very robust uh, community outreach project to start informing the design. Um, you know, one more thing I'll mention about the modeling. There was a significant amount of work done by Terrace to consider um, the existing uh, configuration um, and the, the change configuration under the road diet, um, as well as how that would affect um, level of service and the various intersections. Um, there's a big um, design report and actually like a synchro uh, video model that we have. Um, we've briefly looked it over. The consultant hasn't been able to look it over because of all of our work had stopped abruptly at the end of 2021. So there's some work to do included in this um, proposal to actually dive into that 
and bring those uh, that that information forward to you to consider. But we've also programmed in um, a little extra funding to tweak that modeling given our new um, objective with this project. So I'll leave it at that and, and sort of open up for questions. And just to clarify that synchro model of the intersection of Mission Meridian incorporates the inherent random delay from the uh, trains, is that correct? Yeah, I believe okay. so. Yeah, because part of that effort was to determine um, if it was feasible to close um, Meridian between um, Mission and El Centro. And so I think that's part of the modeling that was done. Well, in addition to what you're talking about, I'm just saying that there was work done in that area in consideration. Yeah, of, and, yeah. and the only reason I ask is because uh, several years ago, um, we recommended that there be no turns during the peak period because of the uh, number of pedestrians crossing and the right turn would block the lane and the left turn would block the lane. So we had no turns during peak hours, but the study that we had received, and this was the old Public Works Commission, uh, did a typical analysis for an intersection, signalized intersection, but didn't incorporate the delays for the train. So we had to go back and do it. But sure, I trust yeah, and that's the, a, obviously a major it. factor. Yeah. And, and before we get to questions, can you just recap again when you think we would see implementation of the slow streets uh, measures on the three residential streets and then on Mission Street? Sure, um, so the installation would be in November for the residential streets. November, okay. Yeah, we would, um, you know, say that council approves this um, this contract in September, we'd hold our kickoff. We want to make sure that there was sufficient public outreach for those um, residential streets, and then we would do the installation. And then for the uh, for the Mission Street improvements, I was hearing that uh, it would go in uh, in January of 2023 or. Was it later than that? It would be later than that. Um, it'd probably be closer to April or May. Okay. Uh, and then would be a, at least a six month installation. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, any questions from the uh, commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Hughes. <laughs> uh, just a couple of questions. Um, do we have a list or do you have an updated list of what the furniture, the materials, et cetera, that are, are coming to, and then where we, we know kind of what the magnitude is and again what we have to we're what we have to deal with in, in inventory even though it's not here yet it's pretty significant we are you know making arrangements to store that equipment right now it's it's a lot of equipment it, it basically is replacing all of the existing El fresco parklets along the entire mission street so you can imagine there's a, quite a bit of parklet um, equipment and then we also purchased you know this is all with the grant money um, we also purchased a lot of furniture pieces. I think we purchased one uh, sort of dining set to like demonstrate a parklet and what it would look like. Um, but largely that might be left up to the businesses. They already sort of have uh, that type of furniture um, or they might purchase new furniture under a design standard. Um, and then we have various types of um, benches. We did like a selection of a different, a few different ones to sort of place um, along the street. There's like, um, there's these sort of like um, cube block type um, uh, seating arrangements and also sort of like uh, it's basically like a bunch of different cubes that you can rearrange and, and change and how you configure them that's one sort of one set um, and then there's like these sort of like Adirondack chair type of seats um, and then I think there's another type of bench um, that's you know more for sitting than laying down type of equipment. So those are some of the points you would recommend, like if, you, if there was a Fair Oaks opportunity to look at the, the full scope and what could possibly be a destination or an, or an enhancement for that. Yeah, exactly. And we can also move some of this furniture around um, if we want to. It's heavy enough that people can't remove it and take it away. But, you know, with this, with the appropriate amount of equipment and the right installer, we could move it over to another location if we want to test something else out. The one thing to kind of think about, um, and I don't, I'm sure Lori in the chamber and businesses 
but if if we could plan and package everything to be a major event like a like an unveiling a grand opening so that we coordinate it so that it's like another art walk it's another you know another um music festival it's the eclectic it's so that it re we can really take advantage of the investment we've made the cohesion of bringing everybody together bringing outside entities in with the draw of what we're creating plus the music the art whatever then we could also premiere this to bring a lot of new business into the community and say look what we've done look what we are we're your destination you should be coming here to buy to eat to rec re recreate but we need to really do that and plan it yeah and so that's why um you see the schedule that you see because we want to be able to undertake you know that amount of effort so that it's sort of a rollout we'd even considered you know given that we're receiving all the parklet furniture hopefully in, in the next couple of weeks we even consider well why don't we set up a few of them just so we're not storing them but the thought was well no we don't want to really um do that without having the whole thing put into production um also the eclectic festivals planned for the last weekend in april already we just had our first initial planning meeting on that um so yeah the, the our hope is that it's sort of a rollout and event type of um thing and that we can garner a lot of support and a lot of excitement about it in the spring. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And really, um, as public works, uh, we're not always the best at doing that. We are focusing on the technical improvements, the safety, the actual installation work. And so that's why, you know, partnering with the city manager's office with the economic development group and this community development will really help us get what you're talking about done. Because there might be, to your point, you know, if we can, yeah, do something really major and really get a big buzz and get social media and get the press, get all of that would be really great for us. But I also see where you, you know, you don't want to, you know, you want to lose your thunder. But, you know, we've got some places that really could use some help. I mean, Fremont admission itself is pretty, you know, it's a major artery and it does, it's not really exciting. Um, so it would be interesting if there was something we could do to, you know, put some interesting um, elements somewhere to, to uh, spruce up certain areas even before we do a whole major debut or unveiling. Uh, sure, it, it's possible. Certainly, I mean, as far as the um, as far as the installation goes, it would basically be you know street closure, a, a you know a quick installation. And then a demob of the equipment, or a, you know, of the installation equipment. Um, you know, if we wanted to do uh, certain elements that we laid out ahead of time, that might be possible. Um, but I guess it would just be how we want to time everything. Do we want everything to go out at once and sort of like a new thing that's there one day, or do we want to do it in pieces? Um, we're leaning towards the all at once, cause it's sort of easier to manage and cheaper. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um we're gonna find a lot of uh comments from the businesses and from residents that we didn't even consider as we get underway here um you know even that comment from the fairworks business that really didn't you know it just sort of triggered like oh yeah i mean they'd be right there around the corner it would kind of make sense to sort of tie the whole thing in but we were so focused on the limits of the project that we didn't consider it so those type of comments will be really helpful from the community to sort of understand how this they can take ownership in this um, and it's something that they really want versus something that we think is a good idea. And then was there any elements of going through and looking at the contract? I, you know, they've broken down these various cost elements and tasks. Was there anything that you think is not reflected here that should be considered or that we need to do something separate with the contract or, or a different company? Yeah, certainly the installation um, is going to be we separate. Got, the, elect, you know, the light, you know, we've got the electrical aspects, depending upon where these, you know, how we change out the parklet. And do we need, we've had pretty much the extension cords and the covered with the safety, safety covers and all that stuff. Is there thoughts of taking our electrical, you know, to the next level, a little more professional? You know, sure. you know what I'm saying? And, and I, I didn't see that in here. And didn't think, didn't know if that seemed to be something we, we could.
consider or we have that we want to consider if the businesses, I don't know. Um, our, you know, our known issues is about um, continuing to maintain the streets during the installation, about cleaning the area, how we're going to do that, who's responsible for it. Um, also, as we utilize the planters that we purchase, you know, how do we keep those plants alive? You know, what types of plants do we pick? Um, so there's a lot of elements here that um, we have to sort of sort out with these teams. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a handful of un unknowns. What I didn't mention yet is that we did apply for another grant um, for this project and we were just awarded it. Uh, we, we received a $45,000 grant um, from SGV COG for this project as long as we spend it in 20, by 2023 with the installation. So we're hoping to save, um, utilize those funds um, for that installation and for some of those other, con those other aspects that we haven't figured out yet. Um, as far as this project, uh, it's been budgeted by the city council through our, our current, um, our previous budget and our current budget, a combination of that. So yeah, there are some elements that need to be figured out and considered that are sort of um, holes in what we've got here so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Dunlap. Thank you, Chair. And um, I fully want to say I love Commissioner Hughes's idea about having some sort of event or uh, or launch. Um, and the eclectic music music festival sounds great. Um, I a quick story for my professional life. We recently did a demonstration project as part of an, a city art walk, and the community loved it because the event really allowed them to see themselves in the space, and it really activated the space. And uh, a community-based organization, Public Matters, um, I'd never seen this before, but they had um, where, uh, a booth where you could bling out your bike, you could bling out a wheelchair. They had a wheelchair there where it had like diamonds all on it, um, a walker that had yarn and it said mama on it, you know, and it got me thinking we have the, the senior center here right right down there in mission and you know why does a walker have to be great you know like can we like make this exciting make this fun and make this really um engaging for the community so that's my exciting comments um my i guess as an engineer too i try to think of all the things that could go wrong and um i guess my biggest question is probably the signal with metro and you know what kind of coordination needs to happen with metro do they need to sign off on the plan do they need to adjust any sort of signal timing, signal preemption, um, those types of things I have? Has that been budgeted into the schedule or the scope of work? Um, sure. So it's been considered um, by the by the design team. Um, we don't know that there's going to be a huge impact there because uh, we don't expect to make. Um, well, it depends on what we do with the south, the uh, on Meridian there, based on the terrace work. But the latest design um, in 2021 was basically just um, a narrowing that occurred there, and there wasn't much that happened with uh, altering the signal timing. Okay. Um, so, you know, the line we're trying to ride here, um, especially from an environmental impact perspective is really like a temporary project and not making any sort of substantial changes that would require us to um, make alterations with signal timing or do an evaluation of an intersection um, to the extent that um, now we're, we're having a significant impact. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, we're trying to keep this on the side of, Right, you know, temporary. But I think and, yeah. some like some court. I, I was just looking at the definitely scope of coordination. Work I, didn't, um, I didn't see that in there. You know? Sure, I mean the coordination was to the uh, to the effect of like uh, this is a long term event. That's what we're trying to hope to accomplish with Metro um, on the project. Um, versus like we're cha we're making changes to the street and we need to coordinate um, a reconfiguration of the intersection. Okay. So it's a really good point. i we didn't we didn't focus on it. Um, and, I, and I think you'll need more than one round of comments to also playing. <laughs> I saw that in, in there. From my experience, I need like seven rounds of comments um, back and forth with the consultant. You're, you're talking about the... Uh, Just reading through the scope of work. I think it says you're allowed one round of 
non-conflicting comments. I think you're going to need a lot more. Gotcha. I see what you're saying. Um, and then I'm fully supportive of the reconfiguration and, and the demonstration project. I would say the one thing that really keeps me up at night is um, if someone's traveling eastbound on mission and the queue of vehicles, they travel through the train crossing and then they get to lend it. And is that, I think we're putting a new RFP there. That's one of the intersections, correct? At Linden, is that one of the, Diamond? Is Diamond, is that the, is that the, the very next one? Okay, then Diamond. Um, if a pedestrian steps out and if we have one lane there, my concern is people queuing on the tracks. So I, I wanna make sure that whatever we do, um, we, we take that into consideration that, you know, if a pedestrian steps out, the vehicles need to yield and, um, I just want to make sure that no one's queuing on the tracks when the train comes. I would say that that's, that's my biggest concern with the reconfiguration. It's just that eastbound one block. And especially if we're going to maintain parking on that south side, I think right now there are only two spots. And if, you, if, we, if we have one lane there and someone's backing in and out of that spot, um, are people queuing up on the track while that? vehicles parallel parking so so really thinking through that critically in the design um, do we need those two is it worth that to have those two spots there um, should we adjust the configuration to have two lanes at some part one lane at other parts and um, that that's my number one um, I'm fully supportive of the reconfiguration but but I want um, that crossing to be the safety of that crossing to be like thought through um critically sure it's a very good point um the 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 rfps weren't in the initial evaluation um they would have to be now because they'd likely be installed before the mm -hmm. slow streets installation um, but but yeah anyway now like without an rfp if if a person steps out you yield to them right so yeah RFP, i i, I see exactly what really, you're saying it really yeah. doesn't change it um and then i would also be interested in seeing um the city's parklet policy. Um, how, if we're if we're implementing these parklets, um, what's the policy around um, the business's use? Um, what's a, you know what's their expectation? What's the city's expectation around you know maintenance, general liability, um, cleaning? Um, I know walking down Mission, I saw a sign that says you know that a parklet the seating and I get it's for the business put it out there as they own those tables. It says, you know, for this restaurant, only. Um, well, I, you know, my tax funds, my tax dollars paid for that, right? Like that came out of the public funds. So this is in the public right away. It's paid for the city. Like, you know, why can't I use that? So what are the expectations around businesses and their use of it and how I can use it? Um, I, th I think there's, um, a little bit of clarity that needs to happen there, as well as um, the a lot of the outdoor dining, some, some of the stuff um, with the pandemic, um, I think some things code-wise we let slide, but just kind of buttoning up like what a parklet should look like. You know, do we want sales that are drooping that people are hitting their head on? Um, it's, you know, we're in this new stage of an endemic I think some of these is it's it's going to be time to to kind of clean it up and 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 really, um, um, especially the parklets. Like if we're going to put these out there, like let's make sure they 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 look sharp. Um, so, I think those those are really my comments. Um, you know, concerned about that crossing, but I'm fully supportive of reconfiguring 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 the street, and then just wanting to understand. Um, if we at the city council or whoever should develop some sort of policy around around the use of the parklets. Sure. So um, this is one of the reasons we wanted to have community development definitely involved in this process because um, they, um, you know, they currently operate our Alfresco dining program. And so even though that was born out of a necessity during COVID, I think there's a real um, desire to make that some sort of permanent fixture in terms of how we do, um, you know, sidewalk use permitting. Um, we've also had some discussions about, you know, in general, how temporary use permits work in the city, especially like we have an event like, you know, the Eclectic Music Festival. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this will allow us to both, um, 
you know, not just us public works, but the city to refine sort of those use standards. Um, and then when we specifically asked uh, in this um, proposal for some optional tasks um, so that we could have some uh, guidelines developed for park use and design and things like that. So that, um, you know, I, I can't speak yet to how the use would be controlled versus mm -hmm. like dining only versus, you know, anybody from the public. Um, but yeah, that's the idea is to sort of start to go down that road. Um, because it is intended to be hopefully a long-term insulation, this experiment will allow us to understand what those issues are and what do we have to resolve to get there. Yeah, and, and I think also 100% um, supportive of the park list. I think people will bring up concerns around um, people experiencing homelessness um, with the parklets. And so um, just kind of thinking through like, how can we get um, like work with the work with those community members or respectfully and appropriately um, and, you know, and address, you know, the business's concerns too um, around use of them. Thank yeah, you. very good points. Hey, uh, Commissioner a uh, Abelson, any comments on the uh, proposed contract? Thank you, Chair Fisher. So a, a couple of questions and a couple of comments. So Ted, you just referred to these optional tasks. Could you just talk briefly about them, why they're optional and what the difference is between what they are and what's already included. It was pages six, six, seven, and eight, I guess, of the proposal. Sure. Um, so the idea behind the optional tasks are sort of geared um, more towards what Commissioner Dunlap was talking about, where the core of the project is um, the road diet and the insulation of the equipment. Um, some of the optional tax tasks sort of address the other types of policy and design issues that um, might be out of our view when we're looking strictly at like how the traffic's going to work, how do we get this equipment onto the street? Um, and then the question is sort of like, okay, and then what? You know, and, and then how do the businesses utilize the space? What types of requirements are there? Um, there's a lot of those types of questions. So um, Alta has their uh, uh, subconsultants, and if you recall, um, one of them is the Arroyo Group, um, and the Arroyo Group was really helpful in terms of, you know, how should this look? What colors do we pick? How, you know, how is this configured? What looks pleasing? What looks obstructive? Um, and so that's this is basically their portion of the work to prepare us to populate the parklets, um, and then. Um, there's one part in here that actually we would utilize to actually get us um, installed. There's a um, task um, 7B is actually helping us develop our contract documents for the separately contracted installer to get it done in a certain amount of time. So um, my sense is these are not so much optional. Well, sound like all essential pieces of the. You know, for me, 7B is not optional. We need it, but um, I. You know, we'd be talking to our city manager's office and our um, community development about seven and seven A about you know how much work do we want this consultant to do to assist with the El Fresco dining program and the sidewalk use program. It's not really in our um, it's not really in our uh, backyard or our realm for public works, but certainly we want you know we don't want this to be a one sided project. We want the whole city to benefit from this. So that's why we asked to add those types of okay. things. Because yeah, the parklet use guidelines, that seems to speak to one of the issues, Mr. Exactly. Yeah. So if you total the numbers up, it's around 200,000, maybe a little more. Is that more or less what you were planning and what's budgeted? Um, about that, yeah. Um, we don't know what the installation is going to cost just yet, but I, I don't expect it to exceed the, you know, hopefully the, the in the tens of thousands of dollars for the installation. Um, so yeah, we were expecting this to, I think our ballpark was maybe 175. So this kind of speaks okay. to that. And then you have that additional 45 years that we were successful in. Exactly. Yeah. That was something we applied for last year. We were just informed about a week ago that we huh. received that. Thank so that was good. Congratulations. News. That's terrific. Um, so looking at the contract um, and what it includes, what it doesn't include. So task two was just community outreach, which might be the biggest piece at $45,000, which was sort of a striking number. but um, I see that it includes one city council meeting. I don't see that it includes any commission meetings. So I wanted to get a sense from you as to 
what you were thinking in, in terms of our commission's future involvement between now and implementation. So I know we had the initial presentation and discussion in December last year, and there was a there was feedback and input and comments and so forth. And now we're you know I, you mentioned the closure of Meridian between El Centro and Mission is still being considered, which I I wasn't completely aware of, but. Um, so I wanted to just get a sense of what's our involvement going forward and wouldn't it be helpful if the consultant was at least one of our committees? Uh, yes, I see what you're saying. Um, I think what we were thinking here was that since the our commission's focus would be um, very much on the um, traffic and you know, road diet aspect of it, um, we we could have um, the consultant come and speak to that. Um, we think we might be able to handle that as a staff effort. Really what you see here is um, we were taking advantage of the consultant's ability to get out into the public, do that type of like very close connection type of work, and then also um, uh, get into the uh, into the council with like how the decisions were made and, you know, trying to address some of those other type of policy decisions um, with the council. So uh, I think our thought was that we could probably handle that from a staff perspective, but I, in thinking, rethinking as you're talking about it, I think it might be an advantage, especially for the explanation of the terrorist findings to have them here for that. So I, I think we could probably add that. I think at least one, it might yeah, be a good idea. That would make sense. Hey, if, if, we don't need it, we don't need it, but I have a sense we might. Sure. Um, and you know, um, you know, even when working with these consultants, they sort of budget for these things, but sometimes one thing turns into another thing where like we find we don't need this, so we'll let's do this instead. That's certainly what happened last year. So um, it might not even really increase the budget all that much to have, you know, an hour or so uh, commission discussion or two. So I'll, I'll add that in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. One more thing. Did you, did you want to say something now or? Oh, okay. Um, task four, which is page four, installation of residential slow street. So this is the one that gave me the biggest heartburn. And that is, it says the Alta team will install the residential slow street treatment for the December 2021 design. So my concern about that is that, um, as it was understood and even said at that December meeting, that was the first iteration, right? And there were a number of questions, comments, proposals that um, the anticipation was that also was going to further evaluate and then come back to us with an updated or revised plan because what they have now as far as I'm concerned is not acceptable. So um, when I saw that and I didn't see anything about any further, any revision and they're coming back to us with a revised plan concern me. Um, Sure. Um, so I, I think that's uh, a misunderstanding because um, the reason we had a November installation versus like a September, October installation was so that we could do that cycle once more. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure that we are on the same page there because that's what our discussion led to. Um, but it might just be, okay. I think the intention here um, is to show that there's not a whole lot of work to do to take that to the end. Whereas mission, there is a substantial amount of work to take it through right. another design iteration. So I, I think that's was the intention here was that basically it's done, but we need to make some tweaks. It, it doesn't say that, but I think that's the intention. And, and it's just sort of like Commissioner Dunn. I mean, when I look at things, I look at things, you know, the black and the white of it. Of and course. The worst case. Yeah. And the worst case is they say, well, look, the contract says we're implementing what we presented to you in December. So if we don't have something in there that says, no, you're not. <laughs> you know that there's you're doing some further evaluation and coming back with a revised plan um i mean we don't they don't need to come back to us themselves but I, I, it's important i think that, that there were some good comments i think made at that meeting mm -hmm. that i think need to be incorporated um and i just want to make sure that's provided for of course so, yeah thank you okay i i had two questions one of them relates to mitigation with the road diet. Um, I hope I'm not misinterpreting this, but I, I heard you say something like, well, this is only a six month project 
And so um, we don't want to implement something permanent uh, that, that we may take out. Um, and that could be interpreted that we don't need to put in the mitigation when we put in this six month project, which may end up being a permanent project. Um, so I, I know there, you know, this is the most, second most congested intersection in the city. And I think the simple thing to do to mitigate would be just to um, <clears throat> change the signal timing so that mission gets twice the green time that it does today. That'd be the simple thing to do. I think what's ultimately needed there is uh, some hardware upgrades to put in advanced detection, but that would that's probably not programmed for. And when you and I met there um, one morning, you know, we discussed four other things that could be done that would be pedestrian friendly. So I, I'm hoping that on page three, under synchro modeling test 3.2, it says they're going to do um, assess any potential issues with design alternatives. To me, I, I trust that that means they'll identify mitigation measures such as extending the green time on Mission Street or something. It, it, is my interpretation correct? Your interpretation is correct um, in terms of these are basically these model scenarios are to identify particularly issues with the intersections that need to be um, run and then mitigated. So yeah, that's correct. That's what the these five model scenarios are for. So we don't know what those five scenarios would be. They'd be identified through the design work. Um, with regard to the comment about the metro intersection, we're trying to handle that work now separately, um, apart from the slow streets project, so that the uh, mitigation measures we talked about implementing with metro are just um, you know implemented as they are, even if we weren't going to uh, undertake a road diet. Um, because as we discussed, like there's there's that 28 second delay um, that is seems to be some sort of programming area with Metro that can be um, resolved, and we have those other items to discuss with them as well. So um, I'm hope my hope is that we are able to accomplish that um, separately apart from this project, um, and then it doesn't become an issue. But um, you know, to reiterate that that is what that task 3.2 is for is for those types of those types of concerns. Okay, I I would offer though that um, without going to Metro, the city of South Pasadena could go out and make a timing change to simply change the green time on Mission Street from, you know, it, it's 30 seconds today, it could be 45 seconds. I think you could do that without going to Metro. I think you're correct. Yeah, okay. that we do have that opportunity to extend green time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and Commissioner uh, Dunlap made a comment about the um, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons on Mission at Diamond. Um, and I think it's a good comment in that um, drivers may have to stop after and make you up to the um, to the tracks. So if drivers feel like they're unnecessarily delayed approaching Meridian going uh, eastbound, once they get through that choke point, they're gonna wanna accelerate to make up for lost time. And then they're going to encounter the um, intersection at Diamond where pedestrians might be crossing. So I think that's just another reason why you want to not exacerbate the situation that exists today, but you know, extend the, the green time so that there isn't this long queue of traffic that waits to get through the tracks and then is frustrated, you know, if, if they're delayed long. So yeah, that makes sense. All right. So um has there been um coordination with uh the restaurant owners of Arrow, Griffins of Kinsale? Uh, La Monarca and Jones Coffee yet? Um, for this project or for the RFBs or both? No, no, for, for this Parklet Road Diet. Uh, no, project. I mean, other than the, um, you know, the outreach from last year, which, mm -hmm. well, I, so I, get, I guess the answer is yes. I mean, there was, out, okay. there was significant outreach conducted last year with the businesses. Um, they're all aware of the project. 
Um, they haven't been approached recently by the city. And so that's one of the things that um, task two would undertake is, is restarting that outreach process. Um, so yeah, they would be engaged in all of this. Um, you know, the catch 22 of this is to get a contract in place to start that engagement. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've had each one round of uh, comments. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, recommend approval of the uh, contract? Do we have additional comments from? I'll move to approve. Uh, I'll second. Do I need to read it? Okay, approved. Uh, moved by uh, Commissioner Dunlap, seconded by Commissioner Hughes. Any further comment? Oh, I need to ask for. <laughs> Any public comment on this? Okay. All right. So we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Uh, uh, can we have discussion first? Oh, okay. yes. So, uh, so I'm okay with the contract subject to the adjustments that we've discussed. I'm not okay with the contract the way it's presented to us. So um, I don't know if we want to identify the changes or yeah, we, we our discussion included the substance of the project, which is not really re related specifically to, the, to this contract. And then we discuss other things about the contract, like, for example, um, ensuring that the, the consultant includes at least one presentation to this body, um, adjusting the provision for the residential street component so that um, the plans that that it includes revisions of the plans subject to the comments made at the <clears throat> December meeting. Sorry. Um, I'm remembering mine most easily, but I don't know if there were other sort of well contract it, types. Can of can we identify the language we want in the contract? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could certainly because it's not going to council until September right. seventh. I mean, I. Do you have your notes? Do you want to? I do. I mean, I can try to reiterate them back to you if you'd like. But yeah, I was taking notes on all okay. the items. I assume okay. that the motion. I can included. withdraw my motion and we can add on the, the end of it, um, incorporating the comments of the commission. And if you want to read through those comments. Sure. Um, you know, so uh, language specific was adding the commission meeting to discuss, um, you know, various aspects, particularly about the um, the study and the mitigative measures undertaken. Um, there should be another review of the residential slow street section before installation, not just based on the December work. Um, there, yeah, like uh, they would be revising the, the design, the, the residential street design to incorporate comments made during that meeting. That's what I was kind of. Yeah, thinking. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I meant as far as a review of the uh, comments and a revision of the design based on the comments received from the previous um, commission Perfect. meeting. Um, as far as uh, concerns that should be incorporated into the discussion, um, there was you know sufficient a number of design reviews. Um, you know, Commissioner Dunlap had mentioned that he had saw one in here that wasn't enough. Um, ensuring that the synchro modeling um, addresses mitigative measures um, and also considering what design impacts the RFBs would have, particularly about queuing from um, those streets back towards and through the um, railway yeah, intersection. I, I don't think it's so much the RFBs because the pedestrians have the right of way anyway, regardless of the RFBs flashing, but just the, the pedestrian crossing sure. at the at the one block east and how that kind of interacts with the, the signal. Right, with the, with the signaling. Um, there was a couple comments about, sorry, I had to run all over. The green um, extension. Yes, um, and so as far as mitigative measures go about extending green timing, whether that's part of this or, or, or just on our own. Um, there was discussion about um, understanding coordination with Metro and the effect of the timeline. Um, there was a comment about um, policy usage and parkland guidelines and making sure there's a thorough understanding about that. Um, there was comments about um, 
you know, tying this into a larger event um, and making sure that is well coordinated with the businesses. So, Ted, it looks yeah. like you took good notes. Sure. And, and, well you're, done. Yeah. and you're going to um, incorporate them appropriately into the um, proposed contract. And then, and that's what will be recommended to the council? Yes. Okay. You want to revise your uh, motion then? Um, sure. I, I move to approve um, the, the, the recommendation to city council to enter into a professional services agreement with Alta Planning and Design Incorporated related to the 2022-2023 Slow Streets Program incorporating the feedback received at the August 2023 MTIC meeting. You're living in the future. <laughs> August 2022. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a motion and, and I will second and commissioner who seconds. Okay. I'm happy now. Thank okay. you. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Unanimous four zero. Thank you. Boy, now I feel we're over the hump. <laughs> Got through that. Our next item is the uh, approval of the minutes of our July 19th, 2022 meeting. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the minutes, uh, do you have any um, additions or uh, changes to the minutes? I have none. I have none. None? None. Okay. You, I've, you've already gotten I, I did. <laughs> All right. Any, any comments? Uh, no comments. Done? Great, great minutes. I forget the process for our minutes, but thank you All to right. everyone who prepared them and special thanks to commissioner Hughes because she does the uh first rewrite of them she always does a good great job okay um I'll move to approve okay second okay uh Abelson and Dunlap all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. okay great that's item number four we go to item number five uh, the city council is on communications. Councilman Primus. Good evening, everyone. Um, tomorrow we have a council meeting where we have um, two major items. One is the uh, the question of what to do about the peacocks. Uh, so we have uh, a number of residents who have pointed out a number of not just inconveniences, but real serious health and safety and property value considerations with the um, out of control peacock peafowl population up in the up in the hills uh, it's not just noise pollution it's all kinds of other pollution and uh, so the council has um, put together a possible plan and there's some options for how to manage the peafowl that'll be on the on the uh, agenda uh, the other um, really important uh, Part of the meeting will be a discussion item of the finance ad hoc committee report uh, that was created in 2020 when uh, it was pretty there was a pretty serious financial reporting crisis and budget preparation and audit delivery crisis that the city faced and uh, subcommittee was formed to not only just follow through with the recommendations from the auditor recommendations from a separate uh, uh, assessment of the finance operations, but also make additional recommendations. Uh, that report came before council in July at about 12.30 a.m. And it did not, the council just wasn't really ready or engaged. And there were some problems and criticism of it, of the report itself. Uh, but it's coming up again, and I think it needs to have a better airing. Uh, we need to sort of understand the substance, the core, the really important points that are there. So there'll be a lot of comments on that. Um, and both uh, looking back at what I think was a real problematic chapter in the city's history in terms of its finance department and the good news of what we're doing about it, what we've done, uh, we have some significant accomplishments, significant improvements, and we still have work to do. So that'll be a big discussion. Uh, the other thing, I uh, probably the third thing that will be reported out 
is uh, something that was discussed last week at a council planning commission joint meeting in which uh, the city is going to have to accelerate its process for uh, preparing the housing element, which needs to go back to the state HCD Housing and Community Development Department for approval. Uh, and if we can get approval, that's great. If we can't, we're still going to be under, um, at this point, a legal settlement framework that requires us to, to work fast. Working fast does not mean we're going to exclude the community. So this Saturday, August 20th, 10 a.m., in the council chambers and on Zoom, there'll be an outreach to the community on various ways in which we are going to try to re reshape our zoning to accommodate the potential to build 2,000 new units uh, in an eight-year planning cycle. Not the city would build it, but we provide development opportunities, rights, densities that will make it feasible. And this is where HCD, the state depart department comes in and makes sure that what we've done is actually economically feasible. This is a very strict um, standard to meet. It is a very tough timeline that we have to meet. We're doing it under legal compulsion. And you may think, well, what about water infrastructure? What about school population? What about all the things that would have to be in place for 2,000 new housing units to be connected uh, to the grids and, and our systems? And the answer is the state law does not care about those things. That feasibility is really about development, density, making sure your standards allow for enough uh, housing so that you can have affordable housing. Uh, so the state has strong policies, strong interest group, and now a very strong regulatory process to promote uh, enough production to create affordable housing. So the city is gonna be struggling with that. I know our community development department is now very focused on getting something out. September 15th is our deadline for getting the next draft of our housing element out. That has to coordinate with our general plan. That has to generate, coordinate with our downtown specific plan. So as you see concepts go out, you will see that there's gonna be a proposed relaxation of the height limit because the height limit limits density and that limits how many units can be built, which means you can't build enough to get affordable units. So that's going to come before the voters. Council's talked about that already. Uh, there's going to be a very specific uh, commitment that the council is making in the settlement agreement toward a timeline for relaxing the height limit, or at least putting a proposal to relax the height limit before the voters. Um, it's going to introduce a very significant conversation of where we put the density, where we allow development to occur within the downtown specific plan, that's Mission and Fair Oaks. Uh, you know, what does that mean for height limits? Is that only for residential or are we gonna also increase the height limit for commercial? Probably not, but you know, we wanna do what we need to do. Um, I think it's gonna unleash a lot of discussion, which is great. We wanna have community participation, but we're gonna have to marshal everything into a plan on September 15th. And if that doesn't get approved, we have another bite at the apple. And again, with more community outreach. So get ready for uh, kind of a freewheeling, high pressure discussion on where we accommodate 2000 new units of the city. Um, everything that we have put in our plan so far, um, a lot of it is still good. It's gonna be accepted, but we still need to make some dramatic changes in order to meet the regulatory approval. That's a long winded explanation, but it's the best I can do tonight. Uh, so stay tuned tomorrow and in subsequent meetings, come to the Saturday meeting because it'll be explained in depth at that point. Councilman McCormick, just yes. two quick questions. One of the, I know, issues um, that affects us and is affected is, his, is historic districts. And there was concern about carve outs for historic districts. Is that still looking that historic districts have a way of being preserved? Under SB 9, they do, uh, but that's different than the RENA number and the allocation. So a city decides where and how much uh, 
it's going to change its development standards, its zoning, to allow for uh, the kind of housing that will create affordable production. Um, it can choose the city can choose to exclude historic districts or not. Right now, what you've heard from council is a strong preference not to rezone residential areas, with, which means that we have to do all the production out of the existing sites. These are sites we've already identified as that will be able in an eight year cycle, potentially to become housing that would have affordable units in them. There's a sites inventory and then the downtown specific plan area because that's non-residential. That's kind of our main commercial area. Right, and I guess the other related question is, what you kind of alluded to is how that was gonna affect us developing more parklets and green spaces because that was also in the development of the general plan over the last few years was to try to get more in parts of the city where we don't have as much per se, that that then might be impacted. Yes, this is where the coordination with specific plan and general plan becomes really important because the housing element, which needs to show HCD, it can accommodate through development, 2000 new units. The site's inventory in the specific rezoning areas, however we get it. Uh, you're right. How, what is our development standards under a specific plan for that? You know, and how do we, are, are we gonna impose on developers open space requirements, parking requirements, <clears throat> setbacks? All those development standards are called constraints on housing. So when you do a housing element, you would have to realistically address the constraints that will keep that from producing enough. Um, as you can tell, you know, this has been a whirlwind education for me. Uh, and it's done in isolation from, like I said, infrastructure schools, and I would say open space, green space. But our commitment is to bring it back and work everything in tandem and make sure it all works together. And am I correct that we, what we're talking about is that right now the city is about 8,000 structures. 10,000 housing. 10,000 structures, and we need to add 2,000. Two yeah, that we're just is twenty percent bump up in in the potential over an eight year build out, probably one of the high among the highest net increases in housing stock proportionately in the state. Thank you. Uh, I, I just had a quick question of the two thousand housing units. How many of them would be expected to be uh, affordable? Yeah, there's a breakdown between low, moderate, and very low, and they score your programs, you know, whether it's ADU program, height relaxation program, rezoning program, sites inventory program, they score that based on feasibility. I mean, I think we need to, it's somewhere around at least a thousand or less are in the low or very low income category. So there's a whole breakdown of that. 2000 is the goal. And then there's segments where you have to show enough in the low income housing category, low income um, qualified category. But that would be approximately a thousand, I, I take it. It's about a thousand. There's been there's a whole schema of the breakdown and our program. It's very technical and it, like I said, it's very siloed. It's all about housing. Nothing else. None of the, none of the other impacts get really factored in. Thank you. Thank you for, for the comments. Um, we'll go to um, Commissioner Communications, uh, Commissioner Hughes. I really don't have any, just to thank Ted for all the work and, and his staff and team and looking forward to our new additions and um, for all putting all this together and the potholes are better on, on uh, the 110, <laughs> three, four inch growth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Dunlap. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, but just just a reminder of kind of where we started this meeting tonight and hearing um, the stories of, you know, losing a neighbor and losing a friend and um, losing a family member. And um, I just want to remind us that the work we do on this commission is important. The work that city staff does and the decisions that the council make are critical. Um, they really are life and death. And 
you know, I, I look at our county and we lose around over 700, over 700 people each year in Los Angeles County across all jurisdictions. Um, around 33% of those, a third occur on state highways and um, two thirds occur on local streets. So streets just like um, the ones in our city. And so we think about, you know, 700 and how many friends and how many family members that that impacts just every year. And it's, it's really tragic and it's, and it's tragic. And we kind of proceed through this, like we're living in a war, you know, like there's nothing that we can do. And so I think I've brought this up at past meetings, um, you know, thinking through ways that we can proactively implement um, traffic safety measures as part of ongoing work as part of um, the road projects, pavement projects that are already gone, um, developing guidelines that are proactive where we can implement things like curb extensions, speed humps, look at the bike master plan so that those can go in as a matter of course of business. Um, you know, recently the federal government launched its national safety strategy and the U.S. set its first um, vision zero goal of zero traffic fatalities in a way that we get there is really through the safe system approach. So I think um, Public Works does such an amazing job of being responsive to residents in our community. When people come to them with safety concerns and, and really bringing the commission in and bringing the community in, um, but um, it's somewhat reactive. And uh, I think we should really begin to think of like, what else can we do? more of uh, just as on the ongoing course of business. If we have a resurfacing project, do we need to talk about it as a commission and have the residents come in and um, um, argue to put in curve extensions or speed humps or should we just kind of automatically do it um, as, as um, just a, a good practice? So um, so yeah, I, I, I say that and think, um, yeah, and thank everyone for, the, for their work here and, and hope that we can kind of work together. together. And um, we don't have a safety plan as a city. And I think it would be something that I would certainly be interested in working on. And, and, and now that we have a additional staff, hopefully we can look at some hotspots, look at some really proactive ways to um, address it in the city because Marengo is one street um, and that that's one intersection. However, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of intersections just like that throughout the city. And so there's there's a bit of randomness to it all that it really takes um, a lot of good proactiveness. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Fisher. So uh, I wanna thank Commissioner Dunlap for his comments. I agree with many of them. And I know we have a lot of proposals um, and a long list <clears throat> of projects, small, medium, and large, to try to address some of these issues. And, and I'm um, hopeful that we can start getting caught up and moving forward and to be proactive uh, and instead of reactive. Because um, I listen to these stories, it's, it's heartbreaking. And I received a text early in the morning after it, that, that accident happened at Marengo and Maple. And, um, it's disturbing. And it, it doesn't mean that there's anything necessarily that we can do that can prevent all these things from happening. But if there's steps that we could take to address the, the, the potential or the increased potential, that would be uh, that would be great. So transportation potpourri really quick. Um, last council meeting, I believe the council talked about a, a, a sixth crossing guard for Marengo School, I believe, at Huntington and Marengo. Um, I knew nothing about it before seeing it on the city council agenda. And I was a bit surprised that um, maybe the public safety commission looked at it. I'm not sure, but I was a bit surprised that we had not. I, I would have thought that that's something that someone would have run by us. It's maybe we can come up with suggestions or solutions instead of the neighbors saying we want another crossing guard. And then the city council's put under pressure to, to agree to it. It'd be nice if maybe somebody had come to us and we could have maybe given some recommendations or had a study or something. Um, so just, Going forward, it would be great if there are these types of operational issues that maybe we could be involved if, if staff thinks it could be helpful. Um, second, I was I also learned a few days ago about another project proposed for the former school district parking lot. Um, again, news to me, and I don't know what stage it at it's at. I know it's going to the Cultural Heritage Commission, I think tomorrow night, the night after tomorrow, maybe two nights, it's tomorrow night city council. 
Um, and I think it's about uh, approval of a category exemption, categorical exemption under CEQA. Um, I don't know the details, but we started a conversation year, year and a half, maybe more ago about trying to have more participation or involvement at some level uh, in projects so that we could provide some input on traffic and parking impacts. And it seems like another opportunity maybe for that, that to be considered. Um, at the top of the meeting, last and final comment, uh, Ms. Knuckles talked about a hotspot list. So I had not um, heard of that. Um, and she mentioned a couple of former staff members, Sam Snymer and Margaret Lynn, who were involved in that. I'm not specifically aware of that. I, I certainly know about lists that we've compiled about specific locations and streets that need attention. Um, but um, I will follow up with her and just see if there's something more to that that maybe we can look at and make sure that we're considering um, moving forward. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you. I'm wondering if that might be part of the notes that were taken for the previous uh, consultant that helped with the um, general plan. Oh. If, if that was, you know, the, that came out of that. The charrettes and all that. Yeah. And that there's notes or something that came out of all those sessions because it literally was a year ish that that was all going on. And a lot of that came out. It was put into discussions and plans and notes and then it stopped. And then we had you know, you on board. So I'm wondering if maybe in all of that, in those files and all that information, if there's that list or that, that, you know, whatever there was a lot of traffic discussions as part of those uh, oh, community so maybe that was it that um went on so if, whether you know there's even perhaps even more nuggets of information that would be helpful to pull out and kind of put together yeah i, I don't know if hot spot means uh traffic ingestion or a lot of development or a lot increased zoning or what i but it but it, it did not come to this commission. Um, Councilman Primuth uh, briefed us on the uh, item they're going to consider regarding the uh, peacocks. And um, today, when I was driving here along Mission Street, I had to stop because a peahen and her what would it be? Chicklets. The pea. Them, whatever they are, baby. We're, we're, we're crossing this. Oh, sorry. No, what that's is not it? it? Sorry. But, yeah, I'm sorry. What, what is the term? No, I was making a joke. It, I chickpeas might work, but I don't. Like <laughs> that that would be hummus then. Um, yeah, every everyone stopped for them, and it's not the first time I've seen them cross Mission Street. It's amazing they all stop, but in any event. Um, yeah, the, I'm seeing more and more of them around. Um, I wanted to make an announcement that, uh, you know, since we don't have the school property anymore for the annual hazardous waste roundup, at least we have uh, not too far away Alhambra. And on August 27th, Saturday, they're having their hazardous waste roundup. And so I'll take my old electric electronic components and paint cans and drop them off there. So wanted to make that announcement. And then I um, had a uh, two page um, document that was distributed to you. And it's, I don't wanna get in the weeds on it, but it's about uh, traffic controls for pedestrian safety improvements. And the, and the gist of it is that where you have uh, higher speeds, multiple lanes, then you need to do more than just mark the crosswalk. It also says you have to be very careful where you um, authorize the marking of a crosswalk because it identifies a preferred crossing point. And uh, so you be, need to be very selective where you identify that preferred crossing point and where you identify to the pedestrian, you know, the best route to take. Um, but what came to mind is the reason why I distributed this is we've had discussions in this commission and the council's had discussion on where to program the measure M funding that we identified for pedestrians. And it's kind of 
open right now. We, we had identified locations and the council wants to make sure they have discretion on identifying maybe alternate locations. But what came to mind in reviewing this is that uh, certainly Huntington Drive, multiple lanes, high volume, higher speeds should probably be one of those streets that we give priority to and programming, you know, funding for pedestrian improvements. And certainly Fair Oaks Avenue, not quite 40 miles an hour, but it has multiple lanes, especially between, you know, going past the middle school. So uh, I just want to make sure that we're aware of this, that what the MUTCD recommends, because that's considered to be, you know, uh, best practices. So we, we need just need to consider this as we identify locations for the measure and funding. So that's why I brought this up. Um, Ted, I'm, we're going to go to item number seven. I'm surprised you don't have a bottle of water with you because you have to do so much talking. But do you have any uh, staff liaison? Um, just a couple make? of quick items. Uh, just uh, I had one um, item I was going to mention, but I, I just want to quickly respond to some of the comments. Um, with regard to the um, Huntington and Marengo uh, crosswalk scenario, um, we were brought into that um, when the item went to council because it was proposed among the, uh, the it was the uh, it was a police department option um, item, um, and I think originated from the public safety, and so we were brought into that um, because uh, the police who were presenting the item had suggested one of the options was to conduct a traffic study, um, and that they would partner with us on the traffic study. And so um, now that we're involved in that work, um, our plan is to actually use one of our first task orders under the uh, on-call contracts to help them conduct that uh, traffic study. So now that we're taking that on as an operational task, we can um, you know, keep you updated on what that finding is, but it, it just didn't originate with us. And so now that we're involved, we can, we can keep you informed in that as is, it'll be one of our operational projects. Um, with regard to the 1020 El Centro project, um, as is normally expected of us, and we spend a lot of staff time on this, um, after planning does their review, we receive um, a package, a de private development um, package to do our public works review. Um, and that not only includes the evaluation of the traffic impact analysis, but it includes all sorts of other things like um, any sort of um, subdivision things, um, water, sewer, stormwater, utility types of work. Um, and then we usually do our review. Um, we uh, establish a set of conditions of approval, um, and then we give that back to uh, community development. Um, we had just learned that it was on the CHC agenda this Thursday, like a day ago. So we're going to do our best to try to support um, that. Uh, but we have been approached many times from people in the community and, and questions from developers as to, you know, why these projects aren't um, brought before MTech as part of the process. Um, I, I just, I, my understanding is that the process isn't set up that way uh, as far as the review authorities and the approval authorities for these types of projects in our municipal code. Um, they're designated with certain um, other commissions. Um, so we haven't been provided any direction to cycle these through the uh, through MTech. Um, and also I know that um, Mayor Pro Tem Primuth had been talking about housing constraints and there is a limitation on the number of commission meetings that these development projects uh, are required to go through. So I'm sure it's a larger discussion about the involvement of MTech, but um, it's not that we have avoided bringing these projects through. It's just that that hasn't been part of our process. And so we're following um, the planning approval process as it stands uh, as far as those projects go. Um, so uh, with that said, I think those were the um, only items. The only thing I was going to mention was the uh, we have a our next public works event is a open house. We'll be doing a citywide uh, open house on October second. It's a Sunday, um, but we'll be closing uh, Mission Street from Fair Oaks to Fremont and a little bit of Mound so we can access the um, fire department. Uh, but it's you know the whole city is invited. We'll be opening up on the first floor of City Hall to tour and get more information on the departments there. There'll be representatives of all departments to ask questions and see how things work. You can go back and um, 
I think you can walk through the, the police area also to see how that goes. Uh, for public works, we'll be out on the street, of course, in front of Mission, um, in front of City Hall. We'll have some of our equipment out there, some tables, hopefully uh, some giveaways we're trying to um, put together by then. But yeah, invite everybody. It's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on October 2nd is our next event. Uh, so I think that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I show the time as um, 8.58 and we will be adjourned and we will meet again on September 20th. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you Ted. Thank you, Liana.